Now, some of us would like to turn back time. You know, maybe we could erase some mistakes or correct some wrongs or even capture some missed opportunities. That's not what I'm talking about when, when I wrote the title of this message of BC time travel. I'm talking about when we live in an era that should be in the past. An example of living in a different era is that porta potty out there. Ken mentioned last week that he can remember when that was the case for this church. It was not even on the radar to have a congregational meeting about whether or not we should have an outhouse or not. You know, we've moved past that era to indoor plumbing. It's not a decision we need to even consider. Please, let's turn to Acts 26, 8. When Paul was talking to Agrippa about his hope in the resurrection, he also talked about the, how his life used to be. B.C., before Christ, the old life. Now, it was a long time ago when Ken had to recall that old outhouse. For some of you, you may have to go back, way back in time, to when your life was B.C. I was five when I accepted Christ as my Savior. And that was well over 40 years ago. You know, try to remember back 40, 44 years ago? You know, I can't remember back to a week ago, sometimes. I have a hard time remembering. And there are, however, times in my life that I relive the old outhouse experience and live in a BC era. Now, I don't know what draws me to it. Maybe it's that unforgettable aroma. The standard of cleanliness. No, they don't have tile floors, it's wood. You know, it's, it's not just wood. It's like dried wood that's going to suck in every kind of bacteria that's available. You know, maybe it's just the convenience of when nature calls. The old natural man brings us back to the stench and the system of what it was like B.C. Can you all identify with this? I mean, when you walk out of that old outhouse, do you feel like, whoa, I am sanctified, I'm pure, I'm clean? No, you want out of there. And you want to take a shower, at least get your hands clean, right? How about when you walk and you start living out your BC, BC life? I mean, you do the things that, that shouldn't be done in a new Christian life. Do you have the same repulsive reaction? No. I need to be clean. I need to wash my hands, man. Ah. Before God, man, whoa! You know, I definitely don't want to walk in church like that. You want to be clean. You want to be singing. You, you, you say... I don't want to live like that anymore. God, take me away. I want to be made right again and be reconciled again. Now, I don't know about you, but I like indoor plumbing. I like indoor plumbing. I like it when Jesus Christ lives inside of me. I like it when the Holy Spirit plunges me into his sanctification and, and flushes that old stuff out of here. It's a pleasant place. It's a, it's a place of joy. It's a place of peace and love. I do. Oh! Oh, how I long to grow past the B.C. era. I don't want to live in the past era of falsehood, selfishness, pride, hatred, gossiping, etc. 
and life stinks. It's repulsive. And I bet most of you would say amen, that the listings of the natural man do not belong in the life of the new person in Christ. You know, that past era of falsehood, selfishness, pride, lust, coveting, drunkenness, hating, gossiping, etc. The listings of the natural man do not belong in the life of a new person in Christ. Amen! Last week we picked, peeked a bit at how Paul considered all the good things in his life before Christ, B.C., as rubbish. They were junk. He counted his great education, his high upbringing, and, and his status for the loss, for the sake of the cross. They were like putting blinders on his eyes or, or a, a, a nose pin on his nose. And he couldn't smell the stench of his life. He couldn't see the filth. And the reality of living out the natural man's call. And Jesus met Paul on the road and opened Paul's eyes to the B.C. reality so that he could repent and live the new life in Christ. We're going to continue where we left off last week in Acts. Acts 26, verse 8. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I, too, was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priest, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and the commission of the chief priests. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. I mean, there's a point in Paul's life where he's, you know, he's, he's thinking he's doing everything right. You know, he's even got the chief priest backing him up. And he's got that, and he's going to Damascus. And then all of a sudden, the sun is, is, is eclipsed by the brightness of God. And his eyes are open, and he realizes that the very Lord he seems to be following is the very Lord he's persecuting. His eyes were opened. In verse 15, it says, Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, who you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disappointed to the vision from heaven. I was not disobedient I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and to the Gentiles also. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. That is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. Wow! You know, when you get a view of the new, you don't want to go back to the old. When, when the, the blinders come off, when that nose pin comes off that nose and you realize, man, what a mess my life is. I've got to do something. I've got to change. I've got to 
repent. You know, and you, you just got it. And you ask God, you know, renovate my life. And, and, and start that indoor plumbing process. Paul had an incredible experience on the Damascus Road. Now, Paul was a grown man when he had that Damascus experience, when Jesus revealed himself to him. When was your revelation of Christ? When did you come to really understand the ugliness of your sin before a holy God and see your sin the way God sees it? Or smell your sin the way, way God smells it. Now even though I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior at age five, I did not grasp the ugliness of my sin until I was 13. That was my Damascus experience. That's when I got a whiff of how bad nature call stunk. To God, to me, and to those that I loved. I was ashamed. I did not want to go back to what I was doing. See, I had come terms with Jesus in the past, I, 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 with his forgiveness and his grace. I had my fire insurance, but I didn't know what fire was. I was comprehend. I did not comprehend the capacity of sin until I saw it, or at least got a glimpse of it from the view of God. And I didn't realize that I was an enemy of the very one that gave his life for me. You know, before I thought I could dance in the fire. I could succumb to my natural calls to lust, anger, selfishness, and pride. And it was all covered by the grace of Jesus. You know, when, when you trust in Jesus, he forgives you for your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins. And I was all about that part of my salvation. But you know what I was doing? I was living in an outhouse. I was being suffocated. And I, I was suffocating my new life in the stench when I could have been living in a castle with indoor plumbing. I want to go back to verse 20, if, if you'll look back there. And, and Paul says that he preached, and this is what he preached. This was his message, his gospel message. He preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. You can't claim repentance if you do not have deeds to prove it. I do not know what the new life in Christ may particularly look for you as individuals. But I can certainly list some biblical things that accompany salvation and a few things that do not. In verse 18, we'll go back to there. Paul was sent. He was sent to open their eyes. To turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan to God. So that they may receive forgiveness of sins. You know, that's, that's how we know what we're forgiven. That's how we need fire insurance. Because we know there's a fire. And then, and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now, there's, just, there's three things happening there. There's three things as part of salvation. The first thing is, God, I'm a sinner, man, and, in, and I'm sorry. I, I see my sin the way you do. I'm repenting. I'm turning. The second step is forgiveness. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And he, he paid the price. And he forgives you. And the third step is forgiveness. And it, it entails the, the three persons of the Godhead. The Father, His holiness. The Son, His redemption, His payment on the cross. And the Holy Spirit, His work in our lives to sanctify us, to bring us to new not life. To, to get that indoor plumbing going. Uh, let's go ahead and Turn to Revelation 3, verse 17. You know, how does God bring this about? 
I think the gospel in the American church is missing two important steps. From what I see modeled not only in this passage in Acts, but throughout Acts and throughout all Scripture. The American church likes the free handout of redemption. Jesus paid the price for your sins. You can have eternal life if you just believe as Jesus as your Savior. You know, it's like most people have an attitude, almost like they leave their expensive homes, drive their expensive cars, wear their expensive clothes, and then stand in a welfare line to get their free food that they don't really think they need, but it's free. It's cheap. And that's how cheap the gospel makes salvation look. You know, our American, you know, we are, we're familiar with welfare. We live in a welfare economy so many times. But so many times in Christianity, we live in a welfare economy. <laughs> Jesus said that it's impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. The church in Laodicea seemed to prove this point very well as they lived in a B.C. culture. Going to church, claiming salvation, I'm sure. In Revelations 3, 17, Jesus is saying to this church in Laodicea, You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and put salve on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. You know, when Paul was sent to bring the gospel message to the Gentiles, it was not just a free handout of grace. There is a holy process. It is modeled throughout Acts, like I said. And there, there are those three major components that I feel deal with or relate to each person in the Trinity to, to bring a grace to its high level that it should be. Please, let's turn to 2 Corinthians 7, 8. You know, getting back to, to Paul's commission in verse 18 uh, that we read earlier and, and, and read twice, third time, it says, He was sent to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. That's, that's a, that, that repentance deal. So that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Can, can, you, can, you, can you grasp these three steps? They are re repentance, redemption, and sanctification. You now the Father brings us to repentance when our eyes are opened. And we compare our righteousness to his holiness. It stinks. It's shameful. It's not <coughs> warm. <coughs> Not even worthy to be swallowed, spit out. You know, we need to grasp the poverty of our lives. We have nothing, nothing to offer. And we need to repent. Then the second step, we need to come to Jesus and accept his offer of redemption. The forgiveness of sins. We are desperate. We're not, we're not waiting in line and knowing that, oh man, I'm okay, I'm rich, I, I got clothes, I, I can see fine. We're desperate. We're poor. We're naked. We're blind. But Jesus says, wait, come to me. I've got it covered. I've got my clothing for you. 
my righteousness. You don't have to dangle over the fires of hell any longer. I'm going to bring you to my kingdom. You know, oh, does that forgiveness make me want to rejoice. Woo! Forgiveness is huge. In 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8, Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and he gave them a letter, and we don't have it, but uh, that letter caused a lot of sorrow. And I think it opened the Corinthian eyes to the stench of where they were at. But in verse 8, Paul writes, Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurts you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but your sorrow led you to repentance. Repentance. Now, remember what Paul said about repentance in Acts? Repentance is proven by your deeds. This isn't repentance in his say, Man, I'm sorry, God. Sorry for what? If you're really sorry, you'll repent, you'll turn, you'll change. Continuing on, verse 9, For you became sorrowful as God intended, so we were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what godly sorrow has produced in you? What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you have proved yourself to be innocent in this matter. Repentance is proven by its deeds. And these Corinthian people, they had that godly sorrow. They came to Jesus and asked his forgiveness. And then they went on from there and they proved it. through the Holy Spirit working in their lives. Now the first two steps are repentance, then forgiveness, but God's wonderful grace does not stop there. God does not leave us to wallow in our outhouse. He does not leave us to long for the slop in the pig trough or to lick up, from the, lick up the vomit from yesterday's B.C. life. Please, let's turn to Matthew 21, 28. That third step is sanctification. Sanctification is a process of the Holy Spirit to bring you out of the B.C. era and into newness of life. When Jesus told his disciples to go out into the world, to make disciples of all men, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, He's not just saying to repeat these words as, as water is used in a ceremony. The names of each represent parts of the complete baptism or identification with God. His holiness, His payment, His work in and through you. All three are present in the first message to Jerusalem, then in the message from Peter to Samaria, and then in... in Cornelius' house, when Peter gives the message to Cornelius, all three incidents, all three parts of the Godhead, and all three events in the salvation process, the repentance, the forgiveness, and the sanctification, or the Holy Spirit. At almost the end of Acts, here we are, in Acts 26, as Paul talks with King Agrippa, the complete gospel message has not changed. You know, many times through Acts, people were asked, with what baptism were you baptized with? You know, some only knew of the baptism of John or of repentance. You know, others were baptized in the name of Jesus. And sometimes they said, we haven't even heard of there is a Holy Spirit. 
You know, at age 13, all I knew was Jesus Christ. All I knew was, was the redemption. You know, I was a rich kid in the welfare line of cheap grace handout. Oh, how painful it was to identify my life with the holiness of God. I, I was shameful. And I'll tell you someday, I, I probably already told you some what I did, but God really opened my eyes. And I tell you what, I couldn't look at my God. I couldn't look at my dad. I couldn't look at my, my, my family, my friends. Because I was ashamed. There was a reason I needed free grace. As a son of God, I still had the choice to live B.C. I could have went on with, with my life. God, you forgive me for my past, my, my present, and my future. Or I could surrender to the Holy Spirit and go through the last identification or baptism of sanctification. I could be a disobedient son or an obedient son. Matthew 21, I mean, yeah, 21, 28. Jesus is saying, he's speaking here, and he says, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did, the fa did what, the father, what his father wanted? And it says, the first. They answered, the first, they answered. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Where, 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 where do you fit as God's child? Paul in verse 20 said he preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their deeds, their repentance by their deeds. Where do you fit? Do you have the full gospel? You know, I don't desire any of you to live a BC life when God has so much to offer in the way of love peace, and joy, patience, and the like. Recognize the full gospel, the full gamut. I mean, that's, that's what the Bible is written there for. Obey the message and allow God of creation to bring you completely to his newness of life. Entrust your life to Christ. It is God who works in you according to his will and according to his good pleasure. He will do it if you surrender to him. Let's pray. 